This video is sponsored by Skillshare. This small and somewhat unassuming camera is the Fujifilm X-M1, but this isn't an ordinary X-M1 because if you take the lens off, you can see that the sensor is actually a deep red color, but why? Well, this particular copy has been modified so that it can capture infrared photography, and that means it's able to produce incredible otherworldly images like this. So how does it all work? Well, it's pretty simple, really. The reason why the sensor inside appears red in color is because it, actually what you're seeing is is not the sensor. It's an infrared filter that's been fixed just in front of it. Now this filter prevents most of the visible light waves that we can see with the naked eye from hitting the sensor and instead only allows invisible infrared light to pass through it. Usually in this spot where this IR filter is now sitting is a clear piece of glass called an IR cut filter which actually does the opposite job. It's there to prevent infrared light from hitting the sensor and allows only the visible light spectrum to pass through and that's so that the images that the camera captures looks close closer to what our eyes can see. But anyway, you can actually convert any camera to capture infrared photography yourself if you are handy enough with electronics that is, but be warned if you aren't careful and you really don't know what you're doing then there is a very very real chance you could completely break your camera. Now I for one am nowhere near brave enough to even attempt that kind of thing and if you're the same as me then luckily you've got two other options. Firstly you can either buy a cheap camera online and then send it off to a professional service to be converted or you can do what I did and completely shortcut that entire process by just buying a camera that's already been converted from somewhere like MPB or eBay. Now this particular XM1 cost me around £315 on MPB in the UK which is around $413 US dollars. But you don't technically have to convert your camera permanently in order to capture infrared images. You can instead purchase an infrared filter like this. Now just like any other lens filter it simply screws onto the front of your lens and this will work the same way as the internal filter inside this XM1 and will block out most if not all of the visible light depending on the strength of the filter that you buy. Now the benefit to using a screw-on filter instead is that they are super easy to find, much cheaper to buy and don't require you to permanently modify your camera. However there are a number of downsides. Firstly if you intend on shooting with a whole range of different lenses and they all have different filter thread sizes then you're obviously going to have to buy multiple filters to fit all of your lenses. Plus adding a filter to the front can play havoc with the focus of your camera due to the shift in light waves. In fact on some lenses, usually older ones, you may notice red markings like this on the lens barrel itself and these are here to show you the focus offset caused by this light shift and you can use these to help achieve sharp focus. But arguably the biggest issue is that because the IR cut filter is still in front of your sensor, only a very very small amount of infrared light will actually be able to hit the sensor itself. Oh no you don't! Ah, what are you doing? Ah. So in order to get a decent photo you're going to need to use a very long exposure and that not only means that you're going to have to use a tripod but also any movement within your scene like trees moving in the breeze for example will become blurred so you just need to bear that in mind. Some older cameras however like my very old Leica M8 actually don't do a very good job of cutting out infrared light and that means that they can be used to capture infrared photography using one of these filters and without having to deal with those slow shutter speeds or converting the camera at all. There are some downsides to this though which I have explained in more detail in a video up here. Anyway whichever option you decide to choose infrared photography is most commonly used for landscapes and as you may have noticed looking at my new temporary studio here I've recently moved to Alberta in Canada which you know isn't a bad spot for landscapes I guess so I thought what better place to try out this bad boy but I do have to confess that I am certainly not a landscape photographer I am way more comfortable photographing people instead so rather than just heading out aimlessly and hoping for the best I did decide that it would be a good idea to brush up on some of the fundamentals of landscape photography and I was able to do that thanks to a great course by Sean Dalton which is available to watch on Skillshare who are also the sponsors of today's episode. Now if you didn't already know Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives and there are thousands of courses that are led by industry experts not only covering courses like photography but many other topics as well like illustration design and productivity. Now Sean is not only a very talented landscape photographer but he's also a great teacher too so I can highly recommend his course whether you're completely new to capturing landscapes or you just want to brush up on the fundamentals like I did. Throughout his course Sean covers everything from the best camera settings to use, how to find great locations, composition tips and a whole load more. What's more the first 500 people to use the link in the description below will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare so why not join today and take a look at Sean's course for yourself. And thanks again to Skillshare for supporting the channel by sponsoring this video. 
Anyway, mastering the art of landscapes is one thing, but there are certainly a few pitfalls with infrared photography that you'll need to navigate, as unfortunately I found out the hard way. Now the first issue is white balance. Obviously having this infrared filter over the front of the sensor is going to create a significant colour shift, and this has to be tamed using the camera's white balance. Now if you try and set the camera to any of the preset options, you'll find that your photos just turn out all red and horrible. So you will likely need to set a custom white balance inside the camera to compensate for this. Luckily, this is pretty simple to do, and if you get your camera converted professionally, then the company who performs the surgery will likely preset this for you anyway, uh, which was the case with this camera. The second pitfall to navigate is regarding lenses. Now, I've been mainly shooting with this Thypoc 28mm f1.4 lens, which I've recently been sent for testing. And although this lens is lovely and sharp, one thing I didn't realise is that not all lenses are suitable for infrared photography. Now, that's not to say that this lens won't work at all, because as you can see, I'd still managed to get some lovely looking images, but you may have noticed this weird flare-like thing in the middle of the image. Well, this isn't actually flaring or a thumbprint on the sensor, it's actually a so-called hotspot, which is something created by uneven distribution of infrared light across the sensor. And I found that the intensity of this hotspot gets worse the more you close down the aperture on the lens, and obviously for landscapes this is going to be an issue as you mainly need to shoot with a narrow aperture. Luckily this can somewhat be fixed using the generative fill tool in Photoshop, but ideally this is something you want to avoid entirely. So if you're serious about getting into this type of photography, then I will leave a link in the description below to a very handy website that lists a whole bunch of lenses that shouldn't cause this issue. Anyway, my complete incompetence aside, as you can see, infrared photography certainly has a very distinctive look to it. But although this is how the photos will look out of the camera, there are a few different things you can do to them in post-production to alter the final effect. One of the more common choices is to convert the photos into black and white, as this will completely eliminate the weird colours while still producing striking tonality, which I think is an effect that looks really beautiful. And I will confess that one of the main reasons why I was so intrigued by this camera when I saw it come up for sale on MPB is not only because it's probably one of my favourite Fujifilm cameras of all time, video up here somewhere to a video explaining why, but also because it is a Fujifilm camera and that means it grants access to film simulation modes, most notably the monochrome filter and this means that if you switch your camera over to shooting in RAW and JPEG you can not only capture stunning black and white infrared images straight out of the camera with no processing needed, the RAW files will retain all of the colour information too if you just want to have the best of both worlds. And although the colour images do look pretty interesting without any tinkering done to them at all, I personally prefer infrared images with a more natural blue sky. But if you want to achieve this effect there is a bit of Photoshop magic required but luckily this is very straightforward. So once you've done some of the basic contrast and exposure adjustments to the raw files, all you have to do is open the images into Photoshop proper and then head down to the layers palette and create a channel mixer adjustment layer. Set the output channel to red for starters and then you'll want to switch the red and blue values around. So set the red from 100% to 0 and the blue from 0 to 100. Now set the output channel to blue and switch the values again, so set the blue to 0 and the red to 100. And as you can see doing this will give the sky a more natural blue tint whilst the trees and foliage adopt a cotton candy pink colour. Now if you want to learn more about infrared photography or you're just curious to see how you'd even go about converting a camera like this yourself, I would highly recommend checking out this video on the Snappiness channel as James does a great job of showing you how this can be done even on a really tight budget.